trusting the taxpayer, a government that respects you, a government for the people, a new dawn in Ontario. That was the underlying tone of the 2018 throne speech at Queen's Park as the Ontario PCs take their seats on the government side of the legislature for the first time in 15 years. Welcome to the Unpublished Cafe. I'm Ed Hand. The Ontario PCs made a lot of promises on the campaign trail, but were short on details when it came to attaining goals. Promises of lower hydro bills and lower gas prices were highlighted, but haven't been fleshed out yet. The province has pulled out of cap and trade, although there's nothing to replace it. And Ford has made good on turfing Hydro One head Mayo Schmidt, who he dubbed the $6 million man during the campaign. The entire board resigned, leaving the utility without leadership. Now, we want to hear from you on the Ontario throne speech. Just go to unpublished.vote and you can cast your ballot on this question. If you were an Ontario MPP, would you vote in favor of the Ford government's throne speech or against it? And you can tell us why in the comments section. One of the most polarizing issues during the election campaign was a return to the previous sex ed curriculum, which is 20 years old and out of date. New Ontario Education Minister Lisa Thompson was invited on the show, but her office said she was unavailable. And that's too bad, as it seems to be some, there seems to be some confusion as to what's going to be taught. In the last 48 hours, the PCs have said the old curriculum will be taught in September. Then Thompson added that, well, things like consent and respect will be taught. And then she maintained, well, no decisions have been made. Premier Doug Ford now says his government will undertake the largest education consultation with parents in Ontario, although there's no timeline for that consultation. And when it comes to the sex ed curriculum brought in back in 2015, some parents felt it wasn't age appropriate. The religious right hijacked the issue, spreading falsehoods about what it contained. So here we are, about six weeks to go before kids head back to class, and educators are no closer to knowing what is and isn't part of the curriculum. To get some perspective on it and why it's so polarizing, I am pleased to be joined by Ottawa based registered sex therapist Sue McGarvey. How are you, Sue? Hi, Ed. As an expert, do you find the uh, sex ed curriculum that was brought in in 2015 age appropriate? You know, at the time, um, you know, the previous one had been, as I said, was very dated. The new one I actually thought was really well done. And, it, and you know, Doug Ford's saying it's going to be the biggest consultation in the history of the province. But the one to get to this, the one that brought in in 2015, was extensive. I know I wrote a letter I know a lot of other educators wrote a letter and it was, you know, I, I can think of 40 different people who contributed to that curriculum and age appropriate starts with, you know, you're, you're a, you know, in five-year-old kindergarten and what is a good touch? What is a bad touch? And nobody touches you where your bathing suit is, unless it's your doctor or your parents when they're bathing you, right? Those kinds of messages. What is when you're, you know, when you're seven and eight year old, they want to know where babies come from, right? By the time you're 11, 12, they have a lot more questions about love and what is intimacy and what is oral sex and, those kinds of questions that is age appropriate for what's being asked by kids. When we talk about age, these days kids are maturing earlier, aren't they? Yeah, very much so. And they're learning their, and they're getting their sex ed, you know, historically from, you know, from, from schoolyards and now from the internet and, and like any parent, and I'm a parent of a, of a school age kid in Ontario and, you know, I, I want to teach my kids sex education. In fact, my kids, I'm a sex therapist. So my kids want me to shut up about sex. But I think that if, if parents did, I would be thrilled. Like, I want parents to be educated and to talk to their kids. But I'm telling you, in, in almost 30 years of being a sex therapist and educator in Ontario, I have seen that less than 25% of people that I've ever asked, I have literally spoken to 10,000 people about sex have heard, have gotten their sex education from their parents, which means the province has a responsibility to educate kids because otherwise they are fumbling in the dark. Teen pregnancy rate goes up, SCI, sexual assault, all of the things, right? Driver's education does not cause accidents. Sex education does not cause pregnancy or for people to be promiscuous, period. Mm -hmm. Now, PCs, uh, on progressive conservatives feel parents need to be the educators and well, religious groups feel the same way about, about that. But to me, it just looks like they're just prolonging the agony of having to have that talk. <laughs> well, and, and most parents are uncomfortable with that. It's, it's, it's some, for some people, it's a really hard thing to talk about, but it, it's something that most kids remember, right? Whether it's, you know, you talk, you know, your, your conversation with your parents, let's put a phone book between you and the guy you're sitting beside, whatever it is you ask adults, they will remember the birds and the bees talks. 
But I think that, that if you assume that parents are, I'm telling you factually, and it's been supported with every study, that less than 25% of parents are. So where are these kids going to learn about it? And if you, if you don't give them correct information, and as I said, you had 40 different highly educated people in Ontario talking about sex education, and I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all. It never is, right? You're going to have a mm-hmm. principal in northern Ontario is not going to have the same you know, conversation or they're going to emphasize different parts of the curriculum than you're going to emphasize in downtown Toronto. And I think that this, this, you know, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's a knee jerk politically expedient thing at our kids expense. Give them the facts, let them, you know, you can't make an informed decision unless you have all the information. And I think that unless you give kids the information and I think that, that, that kids are going to be sexual, you can hope to God they're not, but I'm telling you, some of them are going to be sooner, some of them are going to be later, but they are all biologically programmed to have and want sex. Sue McGarvey is joining us on the Unpublished Cafe, an Ottawa-based registered sex therapist, as we discuss the Ontario throne speech, and in particular, the return to the old sex ed curriculum, depending on where the PCs are, are going with this. Now, uh, gender fluidity seems to get a lot of attention in, in, in this curriculum, and why do you think that is? I think because it's it's a to, it's topic du jour. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a daughter, you know, in high school in, Ont- in, in an Ottawa-based high school, and she's got two friends who are going through gender identity, you know, full mm-hmm. surgeries, full transitions. And I think you know it would be daunting as a, to be you know a parent in that, but it's also um, you know it, it would also be hard if you're a kid, right? That, that in in Ontario. 50% or over 50% of kids who are transgendered commit suicide. Like 50%. Like we, we are failing our students. And yes, it's something that makes parents go, ah, and how do I deal with this? But I think if you do not at least address it, it's not going to, if you're not interested in that, if that is not your calling, you are not, it's not going to register for you. But the kids that it is, we may save some lives or we may be able to help kids transition to, you know, really great contributing members of the Ontario society as opposed to marginalized. And if we are a, a kind democratic society, that's part of it. And, and, you know, and as much as people don't want to admit it, sex is part of the human condition. It's, it's, it's part of second most powerful drive. And if you deny that this is different and talking about drugs and alcohol. If you're talking about drugs and alcohol, it's something foreign you're invest- ingesting into your body. You can go with the just say no messages. You cannot do that with something you have a million years of evolution programming you to do. And the minute you do that and you bury your head in the sand, you are doing a huge disservice to kids in Ontario. What impact does this lack of direction have on the school boards and the teachers? <laughs> Well, I, I talked to a bunch of, of teachers, of friends of mine, this, you know, this summer who are throwing their hands up in the air, and I think that many of them, including the, the administrators I know, are going to do what they're going to do. They're going to take, and I think they do that with with any curriculum. They they say, okay, here are the guidelines. Yes, we're supposed to follow them to a, to the letter of the law, but we're going to take the guidelines and, as I said, focus on what's best for our students and manage it. You know, there's, there's an expression that that you know. You know, that the, the, there's a bunch of often in high school gym teachers who had no sex education training trying to deliver a curriculum that they're uncomfortable with and stammering. And I, as I tell you know parents, there's, I've never had a student in 30 years ask me where their fallopian tubes are, or you know, or what does my semen look like. like they want to know what's oral sex and how do I negotiate that, or how do I negotiate condom use and safe sex. Like they want the details, and parents are stammering. And if the educators can't do it, and I think that the, that the sex educators are trying to sort of keep up to speed because we've got some great teachers in this province. And if we don't give them the tools and they, and the, you know, and, and our governments are all, you know, here, there and everywhere. And it's such a politically heated issue. I think that what's going to happen is it's going to fall between the cracks. And, you know, I ran for trustee in November 91 because I was so mad that they were going to take the, the condom machines out of the high schools and they were going to get rid of sex education in 91. And we are still having this conversation despite spending millions, doing millions, doing a consultation about sex education and writing it. And as I said, it's designing a horse where you get different pieces and you end up with a camel. Well, 2015 was way better than what we 
had, but I, you know, I think it was, and it was a bunch of compromises on a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of issues. It's been done and it's cost the province a fortune and the kids are benefiting of it. Uh, and I know that sexual culture is changing every day. Let it lie. Sue, thanks for joining us. <laughs> You're welcome, Ed. Great talking to you as always. Sue McGarvey is an Ottawa-based registered sex therapist. As mentioned, the sex ed curriculum and Hydro One were key issues during the election campaign and highlighted in the throne speech. Ford promised to turf the board of directors and Chair Mayo Schmidt of Hydro One. Now, how he got Schmidt to retire instead of resign and give up millions in severance is still a little unclear. Mike Schreiner is the leader of the Ontario Green Party and its first sitting MPP, and he joins us now. Mike, I guess first off, any idea how Doug Ford got Mayo Schmidt to retire? Well, Ed, first of all, it's always a pleasure to be on. And, you know, from what I can see, he I've got him to retire because he turned him in to, from being the $6 million man to the $9 million man. You know, uh, if you can retire and take home, what, 400000 in severance and $9 million in stock options, that's not a bad deal. I think I'd take it. <laughs> Do you feel in particular the board and the chair of Hydro One were, were used basically as scapegoats during the election campaign? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the thing that concerns me is the government now, uh, are they going to be appointing their own backroom cronies to be on the board of Hydro One? Uh, which, in some respects, if you think about it, I mean, I what what is conservative about interfering in the workings of a private company that's you know publicly traded, uh, and now uh, potentially not only firing the CEO but inserting your own handpicked uh, members to be on the board? Uh, that's a pretty unprecedented intervention into the private markets. Do you think the uh, the PCs are playing a little loose with the facts, considering just two cents of a consumer's bill, an electrical bill, goes to compensation with the shareholders picking up the rest? Absolutely. I mean, here here's a concern I have, Ed, is that these symbolic gestures, while they kind of make you feel good and gives the government an opportunity to say, you know, we checked a box, uh, it's going to do nothing to actually solve the problem of why electricity prices are, are increasing so much. And, you know, the conservatives have doubled down on uh, paying high prices to keep the Pickering nuclear station open. Studies have shown that we could save $1.1 billion a year if we closed Pickering when it's scheduled to close in August and purchased lower-cost water power from Quebec. We can buy water power from Quebec at about $0.05 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, keeping Pickering open is about 9 to $0.9.5 cents a kilowatt hour. So we could almost cut that in half uh, if we would buy low-cost water power from Quebec. Now, that would start to get at the structural reasons of why electricity prices are going up, uh, not these symbolic gestures. Do you have concerns about Hydro One's direction at this point with having no board leading it? Uh, you know, I was concerned about Hydro One's direction the minute the Liberals privatized mm. it. Well, I yeah. thought it was a huge mistake to privatize it in the first place. Um, I would like to see the government come forward with a plan that would at least, um, uh, you know, have Ontario back with over 50% ownership. Um, which would give, um, I think, the people of Ontario a little more assurance that Hydro One will be operating in the public interest instead of the private interest, um, which is the way it's, it's working now. You had mentioned you're concerned about cronies, uh, conservative cronies getting positions within Hydro One sort of to change the culture, as, as Doug Ford has said. Are you going to be keeping close tabs on, on who's going to be getting those, uh, those positions? Absolutely. I mean, I think this is a real opportunity for the government to show that it can do politics differently if it appoints uh, people onto the board who are qualified to be on the board and who are not conservative partisans. And what would make them qualified? Well, I think having some you know, experience in the industry, having experience in, in running uh, um, a corporation like that, um, a, a background in which they've shown that, um, one, they treat staff and workers well with respect and, and fairness, uh, while at the same time uh, making sure that protecting the ratepayers, which are the people of Ontario, to make sure that we're paying the, you know, a, 
fair price for hydro and not an inflated price, and also have a vision that understands the direction in which the electricity sector is going around the world. I mean, if you look at what's happening around the world, we're moving away from traditionally what's been a very highly centralized model where you have large power producers and then distributing it out to people to a decentralized distributed model where you have hundreds of smaller producers actually producing the electricity close to where the demand is. And so having people who have the vision and the expertise to, you know, uh, navigate that transition to a whole new model and a whole new way of uh, delivering electricity to people. Now, Mike, uh, you uh, rose in the, in the House yesterday posing your, your first question in the House, and you had mentioned when we were talking that uh, you got some applause. How did it feel getting that first question out? You know, it felt good, Ed, and I'll just reveal a little something publicly that maybe I should have, but i tell you, I've given speeches in front of a thousand people, and um, that was doing that almost uh, less nerve-wracking than asking your first question in the House. Uh, and everyone told me, like, oh, Mike, you didn't look nervous. Um, there's something about standing up in such a historic place. And in my case, um, doing something that in 151 years of the Ontario legislature had never happened before. And that was um, a Green MPP asking a question. Um, you know, that sort of historic moment and just the, you know, being in such a historic place. Um, was, you know, was uh, one of those moments where, you know, I was nervous, I'll have to admit, but I think it went well. And I, many people said, you know, I asked a good question. Good for you. Mike, I want to thank you for joining us. And uh, we will definitely be talking to you in the future. Sounds good, Ed. Thank you. Mike Schreiner is the leader of the Ontario Green Party and its first ever sitting member at Queen's Park. One other issue during the election campaign, which the PCs touted long and loud, was pulling the province out of cap and trade. Doug Ford maintains a carbon tax or cap and trade does nothing to improve the environment and, and is an onerous tax on consumers. The Ecofiscal Commission has taken a look at carbon pricing and it aims to dispel myths surrounding it. Mel Cap is a member of the commission and with the School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Toronto and he joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Mel. Thank you, Ed. Pleasure to be here. Was cap and trade working well in Ontario? Cap and trade was working exactly as it was intended to. Yes, it was working well. We've had it for about 18 months, and people have been adjusting. People bought permits, people traded permits, people reduced emissions. We've seen a reduction in emissions, and now we've abolished it. Now, the commission maintains cap and trade or a carbon tax does improve the environment, but Doug Ford doesn't seem to see it that way. How does it improve the environment? Look, the only thing I know is that when prices go up, people look for cheaper things Mm -hmm. and they look for avoiding the cost. It forces people to face the cost that they're imposing on the economy. So when you buy fossil fuel based gasoline or for that matter, uh, turn on the light switch where you're using electricity that's uh, made with the gas by burning gas at a, um, a, a, a power plant, you're incurring a, a cost on society that you can internalize and force people to face. And when they do, they'll make choices that reduce transportation use, which reduce the use of electricity, which reduce power, where we uh, change the temperatures that we set our thermostats at. Uh, where we use public transit instead of uh, private transit uh, transport. And we make individual decisions that are going to improve the economy and society by reducing emissions. And it's not to say we should go to zero. We should go to what people are willing to pay, so long as they face all the costs that they're imposing on the economy. You know, much was uh, made about uh, Premier Ford's first meeting with the Prime Minister and and talking about backing out of cap and trade. Can Ontario unilaterally just pull out without a backup plan? Well, it's very complicated because Ontario isn't in a Canada uh, cap and trade system. It's in the Western Climate Initiative, which is California, Quebec, and Ontario. And indeed, uh, pursuant to that agreement, there is a 12-month notice before you can get out of it. So we'll see how quickly uh, Ontario unilaterally just pulls out. The legislation's introduced. They will pull out. I think they have to give notice for a year. Um, But there are people who have spent 
get this number, $2.8 billion to buy permits to exchange in the cap and trade system. Now, all those companies who played by the rules for the last 18 months are now screwed. And we don't know what the Ontario government's going to do to compensate them. But you can bet that we're going to end up in court if they don't. And if we're not in court, we're obviously looking at higher costs to, you know, subsidize to cover whatever whatever they've lost. Well, you say that, but I'm not sure I, I agree. Um, I, I, I'd love to be controversial with you, Ed, but <laughs> the fact is that uh, Doug Ford has already cut the subsidy program for green wind turbines, mm-hmm. uh, for wind energy. So, yes, we may see a subsidy program, but to, at the moment, we know what we're not going to do. We don't know what we're going to do. Ontario has not announced, the Ford government has not announced what it will do. You you allude to uh, the Prime Minister, though, and indeed the Prime Minister has announced that within a year there will be, or a year and a half, there will be a national program. And so if Ontario doesn't have a cap-and-trade system or some kind of pricing of carbon, then the federal government will impose it. And You know, if I was from Ontario, I'd want the Ontario government to get the revenues from that, the $2 billion in revenues from auctioning off the permits, and not the federal government. But it looks like we're headed for the feds. Mel Cap is joining us on the Unpublished Cafe. He's with the Equal Fiscal Commission. And as we talk about the Ontario throne speech in particular, uh, the Ontario government suggesting it'll be pulling out of cap and trade and, again, reiterating that today you know you brought up the 2.8 billion dollars in in credits and and we at this point don't know if we're going to be in court or have to provide subsidies or or whatever you know the the conservatives quite often say that you know hydro and and the way things with cap and trade were making ontario unpopular or not a great place to do business but you know when you're going to turn your back on 2.8 billion dollars in credit does that not send the same message to the people who play by the rules I think it's, it sends the wrong message, indeed. Uh, you know, let, let's, let's put this in the context of a, what a conservative government would do. I mean, this is uh, a cap-and-trade system or a, a carbon tax. I modestly prefer a carbon tax. But either way, pricing carbon is a very conservative approach. Yes, it was introduced by the Liberal government, but it really is allowing the market to work. It's allowing individuals to make decisions that are going to minimize their costs and, in the process, reduce emissions. And that's something that conservative governments are always trying to do. So it strikes me as passing strange that the liberal government introduced cap and trade, and now the conservative government is getting rid of it. Well, what are they going to replace it with? Subsidies, where they have to pick winners and subsidize business? Or regulation, where they have to go in with the heavy hand of the state and reduce emissions by fiat and regulation? Not a very conservative approach, frankly. Regulate like tougher regulation isn't a conservative approach. No, it's a non-conservative mm-hmm. approach. Go in with the market, use the market mechanism of pricing carbon to allow individuals, both business and consumers, to make decisions that are going to minimize their costs and, in so doing, reduce emissions. Instead, we're going to have a system with either subsidies, where the, fair, where the provincial government chooses who's, who they're going to benefit and who they're going to subsidize. You know, I, I spent 30 years in the public service of Canada. I got to tell you, I don't trust bureaucrats to make those judgments. Uh, <laughs> or they're going to have to regulate. And if they regulate, uh, they're going to have to decide which sector, which company, who's going to reduce emissions, by how much they're going to reduce emissions. That, to me, is a very draconian, nanny state kind of approach. And I think a conservative approach is actually what the liberals did. Mel, I want to thank you for joining us. Very, very interesting conversation. Pleasure, Ed. Nice to chat. Mel Cap is a commissioner with the Eco-Fiscal Commission, as well as with the School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Toronto. I, I want to thank him for joining us on the Unpublished Cafe, as well. Ottawa-based registered sex therapist Sue McGarvey, who weighed in on the confusion surrounding the sex ed curriculum in Ontario. And I'd also like to thank Mike Schreiner, head of the Ontario Green Party, with his insight on the changes at Hydro One. Now, we want to hear from you on the Ontario Throne Speech. Just go to unpublished.vote and you can cast your ballot on this question. If you were an Ontario MPP, would you vote in favor of the Ford government's throne speech 
or against it? And you can tell us why in the comments section. Thanks for listening to the Unpublished Cafe. I'm Ed Hand. <laughs>